Thank you, Antisha. It is really a big pleasure to have the possibility to show you what uh, we already have earned with our work and what might be the future. When I listen to my American colleagues, uh, perhaps uh, it is time to stop allergenic stem cell transplantation and get, go for CAR T cells uh, first or instead of allotransplant. Uh, perhaps for me, it needs some more years until we have evidence that CAR T cells are as sufficient as exchanging um, an immune system with the one or the other source. So we are not ready yet to randomize it. And let's see where we stand today. These are my disclosures you have already seen. Where we started in 2012, it was the primary aim to demonstrate that we don't need total body irradiation for pediatric patients with ALL, but it turned out that th this was not the case. A very few update with a median follow-up of 4.5 years now. We have recruited nearly 1,700 patients in 38 countries, and so these are real world data because we don't uh, look at um, geographical and political borders. We have countries in all five continents, not only from the rich side um, uh, concerning income, but we also have countries where, uh, for instance, supportive care is for sure different to Western European standard. Um, acute graft versus host disease, still a matter of concern because, because acute graft versus host disease is the most influencing factor for chronic graft versus host disease. If chronic graft versus host disease is severe, it is a devastating organ damage for young patients. And we had grade three, four graft versus host disease in this cohort of patients. Um, 13 and 11 percent, so no significant difference between TBI and chemo conditioning. And here you see also uh, the incidence of chronic graft versus his, uh, host disease, very comparable in both arms. So total body irradiation did not lead to a more inflammatory environment in patients who underwent uh, TBI. The big difference still is the incidence of relapse. And if you compare um, the graft versus host relapse-free, secondary malignancy-free survival in this cohort of patients, we have a significant 20% difference after three years. And I think that is the main message. Uh, beside the non-relapse mortality was lower in the TBI arm compared to the chemo conditioning arm. For those of you who are not so familiar with the data, um, chemo conditioning consisted for all patients in the randomized cohort above four years of age of flutarabine thiotepa and intravenous biosulfan or triosulfan. And we had a very well balanced cohort of patients who received either uh, BU or TRIO containing regimen. And also here you see the incidence of relapse after five years, 20%. And for me, it was interesting to see that we had in the chemo conditioning arm a longer interval for patients who relapsed post transplant. We have no explanation for that, but perhaps it is the difference in the graft function. And here the overall survival after five years, 87% for TBI and 69% for chemo conditioning. Event-free survival very comparable, a little bit lower. That means that we could rescue post-transplant a cohort of patients and offering them CAR T-cell treatment or, for instance, plenatumumab in the second transplantation. But we have to go into details with uh, this analysis. And here you have the superimposable curve between TRIO and BU, where you can see exactly no difference in event-free survival, which was a surprise, to be honest. 
acute graft versus host disease. Here we see a difference. It is good to have no acute graft versus host disease or a mild acute graft versus host disease because having severe acute graft versus host disease means that we have a higher incidence of non-relapse mortality. And I think that is one of the key points for the next trial. We have to get rid of severe organ acute graft versus host disease. We have to prevent it. And here, that is for me one of the most surprising results of the last months. Uh, chronic graft versus host disease is protective for relapse, question mark. It is not in our study. Patients who have no chronic graft versus host disease after one year have a better event-free survival compared th to those who developed any kind of chronic graft versus host disease. So we don't need chronic graft versus host disease to protect our children from relapse. Even relapse. Yes. And here you see the difference, the relapse incidence with or without uh, chronic graft versus host disease is identical, but we have a higher incidence of non-relapse mortality in those with severe chronic graft versus host disease. And here, a more sophisticated statistical analysis. Also here you can see uh, omit chronic graft versus host disease uh, in any circumstance because it is not only reducing quality of life, it is also not worth uh, to expose a patient to chronic graft versus host disease because it is not influencing the graft versus leukemia effect. Uh, here you have the composite endpoint, including secondary malignancies. And also here you have a 20% uh, benefit uh, for those patients who underwent total body irradiation. And this was, of course, also reflected in all multivariate analysis. What is influencing outcome at the final end of the day it is the conditioning regimen, it is not the donor type, it is the remission status, meaning that first remission transplant is better than transplanting a patient in relapse. And MRD matters. Uh, if a patient has a high MRD load before allotransplant, in, um, in any circumstance above 10 to the minus four, it is a higher incidence of relapse. So. We have to use tools to prevent high MRD pre-transplant. We have some groups which are not performing as good as the randomized cohort transplant from a matched sibling or unrelated donor, and it is the mismatched donor cohort that is a mixed bag of situations having different donor types, different stem cell sources, and different conditioning regimen. And we can't repeat the fantastic results from Rome, for instance, with uh, a combination of alpha beta depleted donor grafts plus high dose total body irradiation, because in our cohort of uh, patients, perhaps there is a trend for a better overall survival with TBI and having an inferior result with those few patients who underwent the combination of lodiopin, the thiotepa, and intravenous biosulfan. Also here is room for improvement in the next protocol. And here you see it is a combination of high relapse incidence and high non-relapse mortality. And the other group of patients who needs improvement is the young cohort of patients below four years of age, where we have uh, used chemo conditioning in most of the patients where we have an event-free survival of 50% approximately, and the reason for that is no longer treatment-related mortality. That is an improvement because in uh, former days we had a lot of TRM in these very young patients, but nowadays it is relapse, and we have to work on that. And that was, for instance, uh, 
the reason why we went back to our old charts in the BFM 2003 and 2007 trial, we irradiated our patients below four years and between two and four years of age. And when we look at this data, you can see here that those patients who underwent, sorry, who underwent, um, that is the wrong one, sorry, who underwent TBI in the old cohort that is the green line, they have a stable overall survival of Yeah, but I, I can't yeah, find it. Oh, the mouse, the mouse. Okay, yeah. here it is. So these are the results from the forum trial, the ongoing trial. And here you see the results of 2003 and 2007, and basically have a stable overall survival above 80%. So perhaps also for this young cohort of patients, it is worth to discuss whether they should undergo total body irradiation if they belong to the very high risk or high risk group. We offered this possibility with an amendment in the ongoing forum trial, but of course we have to discuss what should we do in the next trial whether blinatumumab pre-transplant will make uh, the game changing. Let's see what happens. So the conclusions for me are clear. Transplantation in children uh, have ex excellent survival results with TBI etoposide. Matched sibling and matched donor give similar results. And of course, we have to undergo the next challenge with a new trial and should address how to improve. The pre-transplant MRD uh, the transplant for the very high re relapse risk groups, infants and haplo uh, donor transplant recipients. We have to get rid of severe graft versus host disease, poor graft function, which is associated not only with infections, but also with a higher relapse incidence, because if you have no functioning T cells and NK cells, you also lose your graft versus host, uh, graft versus leukemia effect. And what should we do post-transplant? And of course, we need a better outcome for quality of life in our young patients. So what can we do pre-transplant? The whole picture of immune therapy, bispecific CAR T cells, immunotoxins, and NK cells, and allergenic and autologous cell therapies, a lot of uh, new possibilities. One of the drugs where perhaps Andisha is not so convinced is nelarabin as pre-treatment for LL4T ALL. I see some smiles in the audience, so I will not go into details because um, it is another era. It is another era. It is not, uh, yeah. Um, so you can read um, all the improvements here. Inotuzumab, also gamamycin, perhaps is a different story. It is a drug uh, cell conjugate, and here perhaps beside all toxicities you are now aware, you <laughs> might get patients into remission, which was impossible before. That is what I learned from all these studies and from the personal experience of Andisha and his team, where we, we can have patients transplanted in remission, especially um, for the refractory ones, but also for the relapsed ones. Um, in the first trials, uh, it was a concern that patients who got the transplant post-ENO also uh, VOD incidence was quite high, but I think in the meantime, we learned how to handle his, this complication and perhaps have a little bit longer time interval between ENO exposure and allogenic stem cell transplantation. But uh, to my experience, it is feasible 
and doable at the moment. And this, uh, I think you all already have heard, uh, the new intrail trial implemented not only inotuzumab, uh, osogamamycin into a randomized fashion in the standard arm, but also implemented blinatumumab as a very, very important key player for bringing patient uh, to a good remission status to transplant. Because those patients, in my eyes, have less infections, less toxicity, and come to transplant into a better shape and have a better engraftment and less toxicity during and after transplantation. And this was also demonstrated in two important uh, studies published by um, by Franco Locatelli and by Pat Brown, and uh, the overlapping outcome results were remarkable and convincing. And the newest um, achievement, and for me also very important, is the use of blinotumumab during the chemotherapy course in the infant protocol, where we have now fantastic outcome data published in New England, uh, recognizing that the very youngest patient with the very worst uh, leukemia benefit from blinatumumab. And hopefully that will also change the landscape in the outcome of transplantation. And perhaps not even uh, every patient who uh, had an indication for allo transplant in the very young age group needed transplantation if uh, they have a stable uh, remission and perhaps having the chance to get a transplantation in a later course of their life, uh, if ever. We also have in the meantime experience with blinatumumab after transplant, uh, either as a maintenance therapy, which might be an important option. On the other hand, it is quite important and expensive to have post-transplant therapies because that is uh, a difficult way how to handle with patients who already have a long, long treatment period, not only in hospital, but also out of their normal life. So let's see what these approaches will end up with. Uh, what is the mechanism of blinatumab post-transplant? Of course, it could activate not only T cells, but also in K cells and monocytes and perhaps that is an augmentation of the graft versus leukemia effect. Very important to study these things. And that is another already shown challenge for the future. It is a mismatch donor transplant. Whether we would, uh, we would um, go for HEPLO with PTSI or alpha beta depletion or with mismatch unrelated, I think we have to investigate this in a prospective manner. It will not be easy. <coughs> sorry. It will not be easy for the European centres to explore these um, approaches because most of our patients identify a suitable unrelated donor. But if we have patients from South America, or from India, or from Brazil with a lot of ethnic differences, it will be necessary to include those patients to our new trial. Uh, as already mentioned, Wanderson Rocha did a prospective evaluation of his HEPLO cohort, and what he could show that transplantation in first remission from a HEPLO donor is better, and it is better to take the father or a male donor and to use bone marrow, in contrast, for instance, to the Chinese data, which perhaps are not so comparable with the pediatric ALL patients. And uh, there is a fantastic publication from, um, from the Malaysian group who um, investigated all um, possibilities how to transplant patients with ALL from haploidentical donors. And they developed an algorithm which you can read in the open access format of Francis. It is a very interesting um, comparison between the different techniques. 
And now what should we do with total body irradiation? I think it is not the time where we can say we have comparable results with alternative uh, conditioning regimen if you have to offer a patient allogenic stem cell transplantation. But do we have the possibility to improve irradiation techniques in the real world? And I'm not convinced about that because we have not enough data uh, how the different centers perform total body irradiation. And for that, we perform a survey, uh, which is led by Bianca Huben uh, from the Netherlands, and it turned out that the differences in the different uh, centers are enormous. Those rates between 5 and 50 centigrade per minute, the type how the irradiation is provided to the patient is perhaps uh, different in every center. And then we have, of course, very sophisticated and modern approaches like, for instance, the VMATE technique where you need uh, 200 computers to calculate the best irradiation uh, ankle and the best irradiation site uh, for each organ whether this could improve um, the complete outcome of total body irradiation, I'm very much looking forward to get here more uh, insight because, to be honest, I'm not the expert for total body irradiation, and I think most of us are not. And we have uh, to improve here the communication and also the information what um, type of irradiation is given to the patients. What I can tell you, we did not find uh, significant differences between the countries and the sites on the outcome of patients. We had not any country where the relapse incidence during uh, the period and the type of total body irradiation was significantly different from the other country. So very interesting. I think irradiation is a different tool compared to chemo where we can compare doses and trough levels and whatever um, sophisticated ideas we have for our patients. Um, but we have the impression we are not ready to compare in a randomized fashion unrelated donor transplant with haplotransplant as it is done in the COG group for a cohort of patients with a very, very low or negative MRD load, and they are randomized either between CAR T cell therapy or between um, transplantation. And the adults compare in a randomized fashion or in a stratified fashion haploidentical transplant with PTSI against an unrelated donor. I think in Europe this is at the moment not possible. And so we have an idea to reduce further the dose of TBI to reduce the late effects without losing the anti-leukemic efficacy. And fortunately enough, our adult clinics have done a retrospective analysis because in pediatric patients we nearly have no data. It was a Chinese uh, retrospective study where they compared 8 versus 12 gray and they see no difference. But I think the Japanese data are sometimes complicated because they have not so many uh, ethnic differences between the different HLA types because they are an island. It is the same situation perhaps like in UK. But uh, Spirotinidis uh, from Greece has investigated retrospectively the EBMT data in patients, in young and older patients, and in a summary, he defined and found no significant differences between 8 and 12 grade TBI. And then he went into details because adults are combining total body irradiation in the majority uh, of their patients with fludarabine because it's less toxic or with cyclophosphamide and only very few patients received etoposide because they had a bad experience in an MRC trial where they lost a lot of patients with the combination TPI etoposide because they had no upper dose limit. 
So uh, they used seven gram etoposide for their adult patients, and then of course they had a lot of mucosal toxicity. In our trial, we uh, reduce um, the etoposide dose to uh, 1,800 milligram per square meter in obese patients, and the total upper dose is 3.6 gram. We never give more. And with that, the acute toxicity is very acceptable in most of the patients. In um, summary, they found a very acceptable outcome for patients who underwent 8th grade TBI, and so that was the basis for Forum 2. Now we are in the future. We decided to be inclusive and not exclusive because when we started the Forum 1 trial, it is now called Forum 1 trial, we of course had perhaps uh, some situations where we were not sure whether uh, allogenic stem cell transplantation will be comparable to the results of the 2003 and 2007 trial. But to our surprise, the cooperation was not only fantastic with all national coordinators and centers in the different contributing countries, which was at the end of the days, whole Europe except United Kingdom, um, but also for South America, Canada, Malaysia, um, Northern Africa, we had, for instance, um, let's say politically correct, um, different countries on board which were not <laughs> partners in the real world, like for instance uh, Saudi Arabia and Israel. So it was a fantastic experience to see how good pediatricians can work together beside all um, hurdles, let's say it in that way. So we had no reason to exclude any one of our partners of the former trial but we try to include now also India and Brazil because uh, they have fantastic pediatric centers in the meantime, and it would be a pleasure to include not only the pediatric centers where I had the possibility to see how fantastic work they do, but also to include the IAS. And whether the IAS, um, the adolescents and young adults will end with 25, or perhaps in a higher age group, that will be a matter of discussion, because my colleagues from the adult centers tell me that they might have only a small group of adult patients who are excluded from a forum trial between the age of 25 and 35. So let's see, that will be a matter of discussion. And it will be a platform trial, and a platform trial means that we will have a master protocol, which is binding for all centers who participate, and we will have scientific platforms. So, for the master protocol, the main question is 8 gray versus 12 gray in a randomized fashion combined with a toposite. And of course, the chemo arm will be the uh, chemo conditioning where we have experience and where we don't have so bad results and which is uh, tolerable and well established in most of the countries, which is fludarabine, thio, and biosulfan or treosulfan. And we will, of course, have all the standard indications and the definition what is relapse nowadays and donor selection algorithms, stem cell source graft versus host disease prophylaxis treatment. And for me, very important uh, additional questions of quality of life that reads easily, but it is really difficult to collect this data on quality of life in a scientific manner. And so that will be a really difficult work. And of course, late follow-up and secondary malignancies have to be documented. And here are the key persons. Uh, so Franco Locatelli will be not only the principal investigator, 
but he will be the legal sponsor and he will submit the protocol to CITES. Uh, he has a fantastic team who uh, is already ready to do that job and uh, to have not only one person who is doing this huge enterprise, we have decided to have uh, four PIs, very well balanced, three male and one female person, uh, which is Anita Lavichka from, um, from Vienna. She's a dedicated expert for graft versus host disease, prophylaxis treatment, diagnosis, follow-up, and so on. Jean-Hugues Dahl from Paris and Peter Bader from Frankfurt. Uh, Uli Pötschke will do all the statistical, um, not only um, analysis, but also the calculation, the risk analysis, and so on. And uh, we will use the Marvin database because we are very familiar with it in most of the centers. And I will be the project coordinator for the next year. Then we will hope to have some followers who will do the job because that is not a scientific way of work, it is only the organization. And so I'm happy to contribute with this job for, let's say, May 25. Um, how do we think that the cooperation and interaction should work? Of course, that is a huge, huge uh, organizational work to bring together not only the principal investigators, you could imagine that the uh, communication between the Pope, the Queen and the Kings is not always easy, um, but we try hard. Um, and to have the project coordinator and the statistics as, um, let's say, puffer, yeah? is sometimes a good tool. And then we have the writing committee for the master protocol. We already started the work, the scientific platforms, which are working a little bit more independent. And of course, we need the national coordinators to bring uh, the protocol into life. And the scientific platforms, I think, are a fantastic possibility to bring in science because here is the possibility to have one database, the Marvin database, with all the primary information of the transplanted patients where you can additionally ask questions. For instance, um, let's say something like um, measuring retriosulfan levels or having, for instance, pharmacokinetics on the ATG uh, issue or pharmacogenomic drugs, uh, uh, pharmacogenomic questions, new drugs, um, infections. Let's do a randomized question with letermovir in our patients. That is not obligatory for everyone and for every center because it might depend on the location uh, and on the capa capacity, for instance, to collect samples. But it is a possibility. And here is also the possibility for young investigators, for young scientists to bring in a trendy, interesting question uh, which might be covered in the big pool of the patients who are transplanted according to the master protocol. Um, the issue for the scientific platforms is that they have to organize their funding by themselves and they have to organize, uh, for instance, the protocol writing by themselves. So this is the sat satellite uh, scientific surrounding of the master protocol. And here is uh, the first starting point. As I mentioned before, we will have the first randomized question, TPI 12 gray against 8 gray, binding for all. Perhaps for the adolescents and young adults, it will be a separate analysis until we see that it is comparable for the pediatric cohort. And then um, it is very, very um, realistic that we will have a randomized question for the graft versus host disease. It should be a 
randomized comparison between treatment for uh, patients with two to four acute graft versus host disease, either with standard of care steroids plus something, and the experimental arm plus ruxolitinib. Ruxolitinib is a very promising drug which is already licensed for adults, and we hope that the company will support this randomized question. But perhaps also here we only have European centers and not centers from abroad. That is still a matter of discussion. And uh, the third randomized question might be a um, CMV prophylaxis study with uh, serological um, sample um, investigation, litermovir against no prophylaxis for CMV positive patients in certain levels. But this is also, of course, a matter of discussion. And then we have different options for additional randomized or non-randomized questions in the scientific platforms. And with that, that, I will stop. We have, I think, 20 different chapters for the master protocol to define, to discuss, uh, to bring together the literature and the experts and all of you who want to contribute in this early phase of the master protocol writing are cordially invited. And I'm really looking forward to have you all in this new boat. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks a lot, Christina, for telling us uh, about all these ideas for the future. I think it's completely new to many of you because it has been recently discussed and, s and in a few aspects decided. So thanks a lot. I like the fact, of course, that you mentioned that you would like to involve junior people. Uh, and within Young CIP, we have some experience with this. So for the renal tumor group, for example, uh, we have Kista who is in the other group. She's coordinating for them the involvement of junior people in the different groups within RTSG. And very similarly within Foster, there's also a very active community of young investigators. And Rulof van Ewijk, who's also in the other group, is um, coordinating and now also in the executive committee of Foster. And I, I think it's very valuable. Um, we have a mentorship program that's coordinated by Daniela Di Carlo, also in the other group. <laughs> <laughs> So it's good I'm speaking on their behalf. Um, but uh, I think it's something that you may need to exchange thoughts with Maria, who is the lead of Young CIP, if there is a combination possible, because I, I think I it can be very beneficial and uh, having them in the different groups will teach a lot to them, but it will also uh, stimulate, I hope, your group to move forward. So Fantastic, Let's thank talk. you for that. I'm looking forward. <laughs> Uh, what I did not mention was uh, we will have a project management tool to be a little bit more modern than Excel files and emails um, by Outlook. We will have RIC. You can have a free demonstration tool where we have the possibility to uh, write on one version of the protocol, to have timelines, to have calendars, to have agenda in a protected area where you get access if you are a member of the writing committee or of the scientific platforms because nowadays it is for me no longer manageable to have 1,000 different uh, emails uh, from <laughs> different sites. So <laughs> I, I'm looking forward to use this new tool. And within Foster, they have for every group, they have a junior colleague who is in charge of the logistics coordination, uh, which is very helpful. Our principal investigators also have selected young people who are already in the steering committee. So for Franco, it is Pietro Merli and Mattia Algeri. And for our group, it is uh, Burak Kaliskan and uh, Cécile Pochon for uh, France, and for, Frank uh, for, for Frankfurt it is Laura Moser, so perhaps you know her. And also these young persons are responsible for bringing up 
the new um, internet uh, possibilities, let's say it in that way. But not only for, you also have to perform scientific um, obligations, let's say it. Any other questions? Fiona. Um, thanks for the great overview. Um, I have a question regarding the Ditamovir <coughs> randomization. Do you also include um, patients who are CMV seropositive but have CMV seronegative donors as they would be a high risk? Or that would you give prophylaxis anyways? I think that is a matter of discussion with the company how the primary and the secondary endpoints are defined. But um, Jean Ectal will be in charge together with Pietro Merli for uh, setting up this protocol and I think there is a lot of discussion done before before we, we have the final randomization. So please join them. <laughs> Chris, may I ask you also one question? You, you, talk, you said about the possible relevance of VP16 in the TBI VP16 conditioning. I see that when, uh, that we still stick to the same chemo conditionings as we used in Forum 1, but you know the Japanese data for infants uh, who have been transplanted by BUSI VP16, and they have better results in infants with transplant that we have. And I remember when we met in Vienna with the Forum group for, uh, for the study committee, we discussed about this conditioning, including VP16 also in the chemo conditioning arm. Is this... Uh, closed and we still stick to to what we have done in forum one if we have any hint that bu psi etoposide might be tolerable for the older ones because we had this experience with the below force in the 2003 trial it might be a possibility but bu psi for instance in combination with etoposide and then on top, a haplotransplant with, with PTSI might increase the toxicity. But of course, it is still a matter of discussion whether the chemo arm should be mirrored with the old forum trial. <laughs> because we know what we can expect, but perhaps there is the possibility to improve with a different type of chemo conditioning. Yes, because the chemo arm is good, but it is yeah. it's too there bad, is room for and, and we stay with yeah. this chemo arm, and I'm not sure yeah. whether we should you in a new trial. You're right. Yeah. Chris, I have two questions regarding Forum 1. Um, uh, the composition of the young children um, who relapsed after transplant, is the composition of this group the same? Um, because I would expect more, let's say, 411 positive patients in the young patients than in the older patients. So the, the starting point, the starting population must be different in terms of their uh, composition, at least in CR1. That's true. Uh, we have not so bad results with CR1 patients. In the age of 0 to 1, interestingly, because these were the patients who were transplanted early. And they had a survival irrespective, of course, these were the high-risk patients. Below six months of age, above uh, 300,000 white blood cell count and KMT2 rearrangement. But if they were transplanted in first remission, they had 70% survival. Then we had, I can show you the slides, I just presented it at ASH. Uh, then we had the cohort of one to two years old. This was the first group because that included also relapsed patients after infant leukemia. And they had a survival of 30% or something like that. And then the older cohort who had a late relapse also did better in this cohort of patients. Perhaps they were not KMT2A rearranged but by chance, three years of age, and we are not undergoing a radiation. And they did better if they had no KMT2A rearrangement. So it is a mixed bag, but for 200 patients, sometimes it was not possible to get sound data with uh, granularity in a low number of patients. But, but the, the, the message is the composition was a little bit different between Definitely. these two age groups. Yeah. And my other question would be, because this was not mentioned, but uh, I'm, I'm lacking the knowledge, uh, I'm, I'm curious about 
what do we know about the uh, immunological antileukemic effects because we know the general truth is if you have MRD before transplant, it's bad, you relapse. You relapse. But it's not true because there are patients who even have 0.1% or 1% MRD and they survive. They get rid of the leukemia by the, by the, by the uh, graft. So wh what do you know about the ongoing research about the factors which prevent then the leukemic relapse even though MRD was high? I think one of the answers is TBI. TBI is a uh, different component of all other, um, let's say, treatment options for high-risk acute leukemia, uh, irrespective how you apply total body irradiation or irradiation. <coughs> the other fact, indeed, for me is uh, the graft function. And this is influenced by several factors, sex mismatch, uh, stem cell source, bone marrow versus PPSC, but it is also perhaps an issue of viral infections. If you have viral infections in the engraftment period, you may have to use toxic drugs against the infection. And of course, if you have a severe graft versus host disease, you need a lot of uh, corticosteroids, you need a lot of immunosuppression. And for me, indeed, the graft function, the, let's say the quality of the graft is influencing also the relapse. We have uh, patients who had MRD negativity before transplant, and then they have a weak graft function on day 100 with low numbers of T cells, no NK cells, a lot of transfusion dependency, and here, Anita sometimes have the flare. We have to observe whether MRD is, is growing or coming up because this is not only an issue for late infections, late viral problems, but also for relapse. And how to sort out what is the most influencing factor, I think we will get the Nobel Prize if we get this answered. 